Chapter 6 Faubus, U.S. Government Head into Crucial Collision in Federal Court Today Arkansas Gazette, Friday, September 20th, 1957 Sitting alone in my room, I couldn't stop thinking about how Governor Faubus would for certain have to be in that courtroom. I couldn't imagine that he wouldn't be there. In my diary, I wrote, This is the day I hope to meet Governor Faubus face to face. I can't decide what to say to him. If only he will listen to me one minute, I know I can make him understand there is nothing so bad about me that he shouldn't allow white children to go to school with me. The nine of us walked up the sidewalk toward Federal Building at a brisk pace. Our group included Mrs. Bates, attorneys Thurgood Marshall and Wiley Branton, and a number of people I did not know. I was told they were community ministers and lawyers coming along to protect us. Between awkward scraps of conversation, I could hear our footsteps on the sidewalk as we moved toward the official-looking building. I had never paid much attention to it before. I was a bit on edge. A small part of me was becoming accustomed to the fact that, since the integration had begun, both my people and whites stared at me. Some of the faces lining the streets that morning had welcome smiles. Others were indifferent, while still others were undeniably angry. I wore dark glasses, which allowed me to peer out wherever I wanted without anybody being able to see how fearful I was. "'We're going to have to take the kids in through the side door,' a man's voice said. My pace quickened as we were ushered past all the people milling about, through a very narrow, dimly lit marble hall, where our voices and footsteps echoed. We were led to the elevator, walking fast as if we were being chased. The door slid shut, and I stared straight ahead. My knees were trembling and every inch of my body was perspiring. That elevator was so full I could hear its guts grinding as it struggled to deliver us to the fourth-floor courtroom. I hoped the opening elevator doors would admit fresh air. Instead, they revealed a crush of people jammed body to body. I was blinded by the glaring lights held high over the heads of a sea of people by news photographers trying to get pictures. We could hardly get out of the elevator and into the throng. Like sardines, we wiggled and pushed, trying to forge a pathway. I stopped thinking about fresh, cool air. I just wanted to breathe and not be crushed. As we emerged, several reporters started shouting questions at us. I felt as though I was attending one of those Hollywood openings I'd seen on TV. Smile, kids, Mrs. Bates whispered. Straighten your shoulders. Stand tall. Step by step, with enormous effort, we managed to get through the crush of human bodies. The courtroom was smaller than I'd imagined, about the size of an average living room, with wooden benches lining either side of a narrow aisle. I had heard someone say the courtroom held only 150 people. It was filled to overflowing. I was glad to see that a good number of the spectators were our people. Sections of the room were roped off. We were squeezed through the crowd and ushered to one of the areas in front, near the bailiff. Reporters holding their notebooks sat in the jury box, and in a small section, at the rear of the room. As we took our seats, I noticed the United States and Arkansas flags displayed in the front of the room. Stink! The room smells now, a voice called out from somewhere behind us. I turned around to see three white ladies directly behind me. Suddenly, uniformed soldiers were arriving. I turned my attention away from the woman heckling me as the soldiers paraded down the aisle with military precision. So these were the armed men who were keeping us away from school. These were the leaders of the Arkansas National Guard. Up close, they seemed much less intimidating. Some of them were no taller than I was. Several men and one woman, all wearing business suits and carrying briefcases, were talking to the uniformed men. I figured they were the governor's attorneys. I asked where the governor was, expecting him at any moment. That's when one of the attorneys told us that an elected official does not have to appear to answer a summons. Maybe I would not have the privilege of seeing the governor after all. I had hoped that seeing him in person would help me get over my dislike for him. Suddenly, a whisper of concern made its way through our group. We were all aware that Thelma Mothershed had a heart condition, and now, right before our eyes, her lips and fingertips were turning blue. She struggled to catch her breath. All of us focused our attention on her, and instantly, I knew it was a mistake. Not only might it alarm her, but our behavior could also alert school officials to her failing health. I assumed they had never bothered to check her school records. Otherwise, they might have stopped her from going to integration. Shh, 
Thelma will be just fine. Sit up straight. Think about what you'll say if you're called to testify. Mrs. Bates relieved our tension as she moved to sit beside Thelma. All rise, the Honorable Judge Ronald Davies presiding. The deep voice sounded like a circus ringmaster announcing the next act. I held my breath. I had read so much about him. What would he be like? A very small man wearing a black robe entered and moved swiftly toward the massive desk. His smooth, dark hair was parted in the middle, framing his pleasant, round face. As he climbed up the imposing leather chair and settled in, what stood out most of all were his huge eyes peering through thick, horn-rimmed glasses. From where I sat, I could only see the top part of his black robe, his round face, and those all-seeing, all-knowing eyes. The seats were so hard that I was pleased Judge Davies moved things along swiftly, pounding his gavel, denying motions presented by the governor's attorneys, all the while speaking sternly. Finally, just before noon, one of the attorneys, Tom Harper, speaking for Governor Faubus, asked if preliminary matters were taken care of. Well, the judge growled, I haven't gotten the late mail, but I think so. Continuing in a matter-of-fact tone, Harper then asked Judge Davies to dismiss the case because it involved constitutional issues that required a three-judge panel. Judge Davies ruled that the case would continue. In response to that ruling, Harper said, May we be excused? Judge Davies spoke emphatically. You are excused, gentlemen, but you understand that this is a moot question. The hearing will proceed. Harper began reading a statement. The position of Governor Faubus and the military officials of the state is that the governor and the state will not concede that the U.S. court or anyone else can question the authority of the governor to exercise his judgment in administering the affairs of state, and since he does not concede this responsibility, we will not proceed further in this action. To my amazement, Harper led the way as several men and one woman gathered their papers and followed him out the door. Is this a protest? someone asked. Reporters ran for the door like corralled horses through an open gate. I thought that they would hurt themselves. The judge pounded the gavel. The attorneys for the Department of Justice called themselves Amix Curie, saying they were prepared to offer more than 100 witnesses to support the order for interrogation. Words were whispered down our line that Amicus Curie meant friend of the court. But surely no real friend would keep us sitting on those hard seats long enough for a hundred people to testify. My heart sank as we nine eyeballed one another with grim expressions. We'll be too old for high school if we have to listen to all those people, I whispered aloud. To my delight, the judge announced the hundred witnesses would not begin until after lunch. In order to get our lunch, we walked through a gauntlet of hot flashing lights and squeezed past people shouting questions. Once outside, we encountered the problem that had always plagued our people in Little Rock. There were no restaurants that would serve us, at least no decent ones. The mighty Thurgood Marshall was forced to join us in a greasy joint that served wilted lettuce on overcooked hamburgers in the shabby section of our neighborhood known as Ninth Street. As he ate, he answered our questions. More than anything, he seemed to be astonished that the governor's attorneys had walked out of the room so suddenly. It must have been their plan all along, he said. That afternoon, the parade of witnesses presented by the Justice Department made one major point. They said that the threat of violence due to integration was not sufficient for the governor to have called our troops. School Superintendent Virgil Blossom testified for a long time about the details of the school board's plan for integration, which had taken two years and 200 meetings to devise. How were the nine students chosen? The Negroes were selected on the basis of scholarship, personal conduct, and health. We picked those who had the mental ability to do the job and had used it. Blossom answered. For just a moment, I fretted they would discover Thelma's secret heart problem. But the fact was, they had never had us examined by a doctor, and there was no talk of doing so. Then it was time to present our case. First to testify from our group was Ernest Green. He wanted to go to Central, he said, because it was closer to his home and would save time and money. He was asked whether he offered any assault against the troops. No, sir, I didn't, he said with a broad smile. Next, Elizabeth Eckford testified. She did not complain about the life-threatening mob that had traumatized her. She sat erect, speaking calmly, 
saying that a few white people lived not far from her house, yet there had been no racial disputes. I was relieved when the attorney said that there would be no need for the rest of us to testify. The attorneys for the United States made repeated references to the May 1954 decision. I had to stop listening. The very mention of that decision always made me sad. It brought back the face of the angry white man who had chased me down that day. Panic-filled recollections flooded my mind, blotting out the courtroom proceedings. Melba! Melba! Minnie Jean was tugging at my arm. The others were excited. The judge was announcing his decision, saying that the government had thwarted the court-approved plan of integration by means of the National Guard troops. The judge's voice was deep, his tone emphatic, as he said, There is no real evidence here that we shouldn't proceed with the court-ordered integration of Central High School. The order is so entered. He pounded the gavel, stood, and walked out of the room. Oh, damn, love and judge, someone shouted using all those words that Grandma said would lead a body to hell. Mrs. Bates told us to remain seated until everyone else had left the room. I sat very still for a long moment as everybody around me began moving. So, God, you really do want me to go back to that school. For a time, it seemed as if I were all alone in a silent tunnel, and everyone else was way at the other end. I would always remember the judge and his huge, piercing, dark eyes. There must be something wonderful in his heart, I thought. I would remember him in my prayers. Come Monday morning, you'll be a genuine Central High student. How do you feel about that? One reporter shouted his question above all others. Monday morning, I whispered. I'm going to be a Central High student. Monday morning.